stocks, bonds, ETFs, straight out of downtown Chicago. This is Zach's Market Edge. Welcome to Zach's Market Edge, the podcast about investing in your life. I'm your host, Tracy Reinick, and this week I'm going solo to talk about one of the greatest mom and pop investors of all time. I've done podcasts about Ann Scheiber in the past, but it's been a few years, and I know there are a lot of new listeners to this podcast, so it's time to talk about her again, because as I said, she's one of the greatest mom and pop investors of all time, and she's an inspiration to all of us who are investing in our own individual stock portfolios. We're trying to grow our wealth and our money through stocks, and that's what she did too, and As I said, she's one of the greatest mom and pop investors. And what I mean by mom and pop is that she's not a professional. She was not a professional money manager in the biz, so to speak, like Peter Lynch or Warren Buffett or those like big fund managers you hear about or Kathy Wood. She's like none of those. She just literally ran her own portfolio like you and I are doing. So she actually worked for the IRS for her career, and she didn't start investing in stocks until she actually retired from the IRS, and that retirement was at the ripe old age of 51. So again, she didn't start investing until what we would consider to be late, right? She started with $5,000, and she parlayed it into $20 million by the time she died, And then a year after that, when her story was revealed and the press was talking about her, she had donated the money to Yeshiva University. And at that time, when the story broke, her portfolio was worth $22 million. So this was the period between 1944 and 1994. So 50 years she invested. which seems like a long time, right? But just goes to tell you that some good things do happen the longer you're in the game. So inflation adjusted, the $5,000 um, in 1944 is worth about $80,000 here in 2022. Just so you kind of know like what the amount was that she started with. Because the 5000 doesn't sound like much to us today but it was really worth about $80,000 back then, which is a like nice chunk of change, but it's not millions of dollars she started with either. And the 20 million she had when she died in 1994 would be worth about $38 million today adjusted for inflation. So again, just to give you an idea of what she was able to grow this money into. But even if you don't adjust it, to 20 million in 50 years, it ranks among the top of even the professional managers uh, of all time. So according to Money Magazine's article about Anne, which appeared in January 1st, 1996, her return worked out to be 22.1% a year. And she did have all 50 years in order to uh, build that But it's hard to keep that kind of track record going over really long periods of time. It's one thing to do it over five years, 10 years, even 20 years. But once you get way out there, it's just really hard to outperform. (laughs) Let's just put it that way. And this was even better than Ben Graham's return of 17.4%. Um, It was slightly under what Warren Buffett's was by 1995, but again, I'd have to see what his actual rate is now that he too has stretched out past like the 50-year mark or close to that. Your returns start to go down. It was, however, below Peter Lynch, the Fidelity Magellan manager. He's considered to be one of the greatest mutual fund managers of all time, and his Uh, average return was 29.2%. And again, hers was 22.1, but hers was over that longer time period. So it's even more impressive. So how'd she do it? That's what I always like to talk about on this podcast, because we all want to know, how did this just regular former IRS auditor 
do it and grow her portfolio in such an astounding manner. So she really had no special background. She was one of nine kids in her family. There were four boys and five girls. The money in the family all went to the boys for their education. So she had to find a way on her own to uh, get schooling and go to work early. So by age 15, she already went to work as a bookkeeper. And then later she put herself through night school at what is now the GW Law School in Washington, D.C., the George Washington Law School. She got a job in 1920 as an auditor at the IRS, and she stayed there for 23 years. She never really got promoted, actually, <laughs> during all those that time, despite having passed the bar exam. Um, so when she retired in 1943, she was only making $3,150. So again, just for comparison purposes, that would be about $53,000 in today's money. So she was solidly middle class. She was never earning, you know, the upper middle class type of money, which today we would consider, you know, uh, over $100,000, you know, over $200,000 where it's kind of easy to save money. But she also was never uh, married or had kids, so she never had the expenses of bringing up the kids either while living on this money. She did move to uh, she where she was living in New York City at the time, and she did manage to snag a rent-controlled apartment. So she was able to keep her apartment, her living costs, you know, her home costs really low as well during this time. So why stocks? It would have been unusual for a woman in the 1930s and 1940s to want to invest in stocks. That's just how it went back in the day. All the stockbrokers were men. Um, you know, people who bought the stock were men. That's just how it went. But why did she think she should invest in stocks? And, and why did she choose that method as a way to try to grow her money? And it was mainly because of her auditing job at the IRS. So she did audit lots of rich people, it turns out. And one thing she noticed on all of their um, you know, tax returns were stocks. And so she uh, uh, you know, tied in together the stocks with being rich. So, but stocks are available to everyone, right? So that's why she started... Um, originally getting into the stock market. So how did she get the original $5,000? Because that was about $80,000 in today's money. She was only making $53,000 a year. Well, she originally had even more money from her savings, from skimping, from, uh, you know, keeping an eye on her budget, from living in a rent-controlled apartment, her brother was a stockbroker, apparently, and in the 1930s, she gave him her savings to invest because, again, it was unusual for women to invest. And, hey, her brother's a stockbroker. He can do it. And he lost it all during the bear market of the late 1930s. A lot of people remember the Great Depression, the 1929 collapse, which lasted through 1932, that bear market. But there was another one in the late 1930s after that um, recession or depression that we had in the late 1930s. And then World War II began, and it was not a good time to be an investor in the stock market, very difficult conditions, and he lost it all. So she said, forget you, I'm going to do it myself. So she stayed in her job, she saved it up again, and according to her, her stockbroker that she had at the time she died, she was saving up to 80% of her income. Now, I really don't recommend this method, right? That's even higher than today's FIRE people, you know, the F-I-R-E people, the financial independence retire early people. They save 50% in order to retire early and invest it and in order to quit their jobs and do something else. But 80% is almost really not doable for 99.9% .9 of people. So I don't recommend it, but, you know, just have a healthy savings rate and you can still succeed, have some savings in order to buy stocks. So she decided to go all in and, and have this bigger amount of money to invest. So she started doing research on companies using Merrill Lynch reports 
Those are her stockbroker reports. She went to the annual meetings back then. They were, um, you know, a lot of the companies were in the New York area. So she would just go attend the meetings as a shareholder. Um, she would compare what the company was saying in the annual and quarterly reports with what the Merrill Lynch analysts were saying so that she got a good idea of who knew what about the company. And her broker, when she died, uh, told Money Magazine that she liked the big branded companies. And she looked mostly in drugs, so big pharma, beverages, and entertainment. He said she rarely bought more than 100 shares of any company at any like given time. But once in 1950, she did buy 1,000 shares of Sharing Plow, which was a big drug maker at the time. Uh, you know, it's like a Pfizer at the time. And so that was a big purchase for her uh, to go all in in 1950. Another thing that she did that was, it turned out to be quite successful, was that she bought and held. She almost never sold anything. But this happened only really by accident. Her broker said that she didn't like to pay the commissions on the broker commissions on the trades. And back in the day, this may sound uh, kind of strange to those of you who are younger, who maybe only started investing the last couple of years where we didn't even have fees on investing on say like a Robinhood account or whatnot, but it used to be very expensive to buy and sell stock. And you had to do like the hundred share thing because they penalized you if you only wanted to do 50 shares or 25 shares. You basically had to buy in these like lump sum like allotments and a hundred was the preferred allotment. And I remember from the 1980s and 90s when I first started investing, it was like $100 or something for me to do one trade to buy a stock. And that was a lot of money in like the early 1990s, $100 to buy the stock. That was like more than I wanted to like invest in there. So that's why she didn't do it. She hated giving the brokerage her money. So she rarely, if ever sold. She never did, even if the stock went nowhere for years because she couldn't stand to pay the commissions. So her buy and hold strategy, which does work, as we know, especially over long periods of times like this, 50 years, only happened by accident. But it is something that those of us can learn a lot from because it can work. And then she had dividends. So not every stock you buy will have the dividends. And I'm sure not every stock she bought had them either, but many did, especially in the drug area, you know, big pharma, they paid the dividends even back in the day. And so by the early 1980s, when she was nearly 90 years old, um, her portfolio at that time had a hundred stocks in it. And I'll have some more to say about having a hundred stocks in your portfolio. That's an incredible amount. Um, but it was worth $10 million. Even after the 1970s super bear market, so 1972, 73, the stock market was down, you know, over double digits. It was a bear. It was down like 40, over 40% 40 at some point in there as stocks got crushed, even the rest of the decade high inflation. This was time when equities were considered dead. Nobody wanted them. I could go just get a CD in the bank for, you know, like 15%. Why would I own a stock? Yet she did stay the course in there. Um, and because many of her companies were paying the dividends, she was buying as uh, she reinvested and she was buying as they declined during that period. And again, remember, this is the time before 401ks, and before IRAs and when you had a, you know, a taxable account, that's all you could have for stocks. Now we have the non-taxable with the IRAs and the Roth IRAs, which let you take it out without paying a tax even when you withdraw it. These would have been gold for her, right? I do think if she was doing this strategy now, she would be all over any kind of Roth 
um, and any kind of the, these taxable or, or these tax-free accounts that let the basis grow without paying the taxes. But she didn't have that. She had it in just a regular account and now it was worth $10 million and she's getting all these dividends. So according to the Money Magazine article, her broker said she was getting $40,000 a month in dividend income by like 1980. 40000 a month. I would take that today in dividend income, let alone in 1980. I didn't do the inflation adjusted, but it's an enormous amount of money, right? But that was all taxable. But how does she pay the taxes on that? Even if it's only 20% on a capital gain tax, I'm not sure what it was in the 1970s, but that starts to become overwhelming. She would have to sell some stocks or not reinvest that dividend, keep the cash in order to pay the taxes, right? So at that time, her broker convinced her to shift those dividends into tax-exempt bond notes, tax-exempt bond notes. Some of them were paying about 8%, but those were completely tax-free. So she was able to switch it over there. She did keep some in cash to pay some of the taxes, but those dividends then continued to grow in this tax-free manner after she bought into the bonds. So as the bull market, though, took hold, starting in 1982, we had a bull market in stocks. Her dividends that had been paying out and been reinvesting during all those prior years did grow and compound. So she was making something like $750,000 a year on her account by the time she died in the 1990s. So dividends do matter. They do add up. You think, oh, I'm just getting a couple dollars here or there. But if you own over long periods of time and these companies, some of them dividend aristocrats, that means they not only paid out every year for decades, but many of them raised their dividend over those decades too. There are companies that have raised dividends, you know, for 20 or 25 consecutive years, even with the financial crisis, even with uh, COVID, you know, with all these things going on, they have managed to do it. And if you own one or two of those, you're doing it too, right? So it adds up. Now, her broker did say the last stock she bought was in 1985. So that was right around when she was 90. Um, and so she went in for one last uh, hurrah in those. She did buy 100 shares each of these last two stocks because that's what she did for all of her career except with the sharing plow when she bought the 1,000 shares. And what were they? What, were, what, what did she think she should buy in 1985? Um, she bought MCI, which I had to look up, and it's a telecom. It was founded in 1983, and it's now owned by Verizon. But it was part of like the big AT and T, you know, MCI that that whole telecom thing that was going on in the eighties. And then she bought Apple. She had owned some Apple originally. So her broker said she didn't buy much tech because she didn't really trust technology. Not surprising, right? As we get older, we become a little bit scared of using it or the new things that are out there. And you're like, eh, I don't really understand what that's all about. So I'm not buying something I don't understand. But um, it didn't impact her investing prowess, right? So she still managed to be one of the most successful mom and pop average Joe Schmo investor person just sitting there on the sidelines, even without doing like an IBM, which would have been one of the big text names from like the 50s, 60s, and 70s, or a Xerox. That was one of the nifty 50 stocks in the 60s that everybody bought because it was the next cool thing. They were making copying machines. Everybody had to buy one of those and they had all this growth and earnings were soaring, but she didn't buy what she didn't know. So what can we do out of her story that she did? Well, I think you're getting some clues already that there's a lot of what she did that we could do, right? So one of the first things she did is that she did buy what she knew, as I was just mentioning. So she drank Coke. So she ended up buying that. That's like the old, that's like what Warren Buffett did. He loves Coke. He bought it too. So they were in, in lockstep with that. When Pepsi came out, she tried it. She determined, oh, I kind of like this drink too. And she bought some of it. Um, if 
she was going to a lot of movies. She loved going to the movies. So she ended up buying a lot of movie studios, which today are not that great of an investment. Um, although some of you may tweet at me arguing that like with Paramount and some of these, they're now considered, you know, basically streaming services, but you do have the studio component too. Um, but back in the day, this was kind of a newer technology, right? And there was a lot of growth in Hollywood. So she bought like Paramount and Columbia Pictures. Those were good performers in her portfolio over those 50 years. If she didn't get it, as I said, as I mentioned about the tax, she avoided it. But again, this never hurt her returns. She averaged 22.1%, even without having the big tech position. Uh, another thing she did is that, as I mentioned, she looked for growing earnings, but her broker said not necessarily low PEs. So she wasn't really a value investor in that way because she held for so long over so many decades that she always believed at some times some stocks would be cheap. At other times, they weren't going to be. So what could you rely on as an indicator over really long periods of time? Really, you could rely on whether or not they can grow their earnings year over year. And uh, believe it or not, some of these companies have managed to do it, right? Most of them that she invested in, even like a Coke, are no longer doing the double-digit earnings or sales growth anymore. They are older, more mature companies now. But for many years, they did manage to do it, and they are still managing to grow even if it's in the single digits all these years later. So look for companies with growing earnings because that is key. Then she also did invest fairly small. She usually just bought 100 shares of most companies. And then ex outside of the sharing plow where she bought 1,000 shares, but that allowed her to be diverse because she did spread her money around. As I mentioned, she had 100 holdings by 19, um, early 1980s, by like 1980, which is maybe also why she only ended up buying her last stocks in 1985, even though she lived another 10 years. Um, you know, there's only so much diversity that you need. Uh, and I um, think that being diverse is very important because as we learned during the Great Recession, when some of the banks went under, other businesses went under, bankruptcies can happen. Um, if a company gets into trouble, if there's a pandemic and you own a movie theater chain, maybe you also own something else that's going to do well under those market conditions. So diversity is key, but 100 stocks is just too many. I salute her for being involved and reading the analyst reports and the quarterly earnings and going to the meetings for you know dozens of these companies, but it's just way too many for the average uh, investor to follow, to keep track of, to even know what they're doing. So I'm going to talk a little bit, a little bit later about what you should be doing, but you should be diverse. So follow her in diversity and small is fine. You know, only a hundred shares or that kind of thing, but a hundred is just too many. Also, another thing you and I can do is reinvest those dividends, as I've already talked about. Dividends compound too. And unlike Anne, you can have your stocks in one of those tax-free accounts and compounding it, either in an IRA or a Roth IRA, or if you're at work, you'll have the 401k. It's growing in there without paying any taxes. And the Roth um, 401k, if your company offers it, the money will grow tax-free. And in the Roth, it is even tax-free when you withdraw it, so even better. But whatever you do, these accounts are available to you and you can reinvest the dividends and compound those dividends. And then one of her key things that she did that is hard to replicate, and this is also what is found in all great investors, whether or not they're professionals or the mom and pop like we are, is to not panic. She did not sell in the 70s bear market, even though it was really brutal. So her uh, stockbroker said that some of her drug stocks, like a sharing plow, were down 50% in the 1970s. But since she didn't want to pay any of these commissions, 
she basically just left it in there and and dealt with the pain and he said she used to say i know it'll rebound at some point and it did so her investing timeline was 50 years you may have some stocks that are down big here in 2022 we all do right we've had a bear market pullback here some stocks are down even 40 50 60 percent off their highs or even year to date um, but the longer timeline is what can help you when you're dealing with these kinds of pullbacks corrections or sell-offs so have you ever owned a stock for even 10 years? A lot can go on in a 10-year time period, right? So if it was from 2001 to 2011, you had the dot-com bust, you had 9-11, you had the Great Recession, there was like a Eurozone crisis at the end of that, all this stuff was going on. Stocks had a rough time during that 10-year time period. But what if it was from 2011 to 2021? We had some things happen in that era too. We had the manufacturing recession of 2015, 2016 with the oil uh, price collapse. We had the pandemic, who can forget that, with the recession along with the pandemic, millions of people out of work. Um, so none of that was great either, but stocks were in a different phase then and we had very solid returns in a diverse portfolio or in the major indexes like even the s p 500 the triple q's outperformed the nasdaq did um, even more so because tech was in again during that era so there's always um opportunities where you can have a crisis in one year but it might be forgotten even just a year or two later. Look at the coronavirus pandemic. It hit us over only just a little over two years ago. And, you know, business was terrible in 2020 globally. It, you know, everything was in lockdown, things were shut down, everybody was at home, restaurants weren't operating except, you know, through delivery only, companies suspended dividends, they froze salaries, they laid off some people, but, that seems like a while ago now, doesn't it? Seems like a long, long time ago, but it really wasn't. It was only a little over two years ago. So Ann Scheiber was rich when she died at 101 in 1995. As I mentioned earlier, her $22 million portfolio by that time, 22 million, was left to Yeshiva University in New York City. And if you Google Yeshiva University now and Ann Scheiber, you'll find the Ann Scheiber Scholarship Fund. So it was established for financially and academically deserving women who indicated their desire to assist in the development of humanity and alleviate pain and suffering. So what it goes to is it covers tuition for medical school and it will cover all four years. And it's like the full tuition. So that's amazing. And now I notice on their website, there's also a second scholarship that's just called the Scheiber STEM Undergraduate Scholarship. And that's a $10,000 annual scholarship to uh, someone who's enrolled in the Stern College of Women's STEM-related programs. And it lists out what are the STEM-related programs in that college, also at Yeshiva. And so somehow they've decided maybe the the initial donation was simply churning out too much income too many dividends um and so they decided to start the second scholarship based on her incredible gift and so that is out there too um just based on investing in stocks essentially so i did discover and i never noticed this before when I've done this podcast in the past, but this time I discovered that Yeshiva didn't actually get the money until 2002, 2003 time period because the state was in probate all those years. So she died in like 94. They announced that Yeshiva was getting it in 95. They didn't get it until 2002. So it just sat in there in the things that she was investing in, like sharing plow. So the 22 million in 1995 had grown to 
$36 million by 2002. The power of compounding, also the power of a mega bull market at the end of the 1990s, even if she wasn't in uh, tech related or dot coms in any way. And there's no indication she owned, like, say, Microsoft at all by 1994 when she died because her last stocks that she bought were Apple and MCI. So we don't have any indication she owned Microsoft in there. And we know she wasn't buying Cisco or Dell. They all went IPO later than 1985. So even with that, she still managed to grow this portfolio to $36 million by doing nothing from 1995 and uh, it does help, however, that she was in Sharing Plow, that that investment that she made in 1950 was still in the portfolio because the 1990s uh, was huge for the drug stocks. It's kind of forgotten now how well the drug stocks did in the 1990s. They also had their own mini boom bull market in the 1990s. Everybody was buying all the creative drug makers and biotechs that was in big along with the tech stocks. And so if you bought, you know, the Pfizer's, the Merck's, the um, Eli Lilly's, the sharing plow, you did well. And they didn't get hammered quite as badly in the sell-off of the dot-com bust. Um, going into, say, 2002. So that big position in sharing plow also helped drive it up to $36 million. So by 1995, her portfolio was 60% stocks, 30% of the bonds. That's from buying them after those dividends were coming in to get them into the tax-free account. And she did have 10% in cash to probably pay some of the taxes on uh, those dividends coming in. But again, this was a taxable account. Her broker did say it was generating about 800000 in dividends by her death in 1995. So again, I'm scared to know what it was generating by 2002. But given the amount of full tuition scholarships that Yeshiva it has doled out since they started doing it in 2002, 2003 with her money, um, it seems to be quite a lot and that those dividends still are probably paying for this program. I'm sure they're not dipping into the principal whatsoever. And um, so that is the driver for it. Now, back to what she owned, because that's what we care about. Can we apply anything about what she owned to our own portfolios? So that thousand shares of sharing plow that she bought yeah, I think they said it was ten thousand dollars. So a thousand shares, she spent ten thousand dollars. It grew to one hundred and twenty eight thousand shares by the time of her death. That is from the dividends, right? Um, and splits and whatever else was going on. But dividends and splits getting you that one hundred and twenty eight thousand shares. It was worth $7.5 million at the time. Now, it was her largest position when she died, and the top six holdings in her portfolio uh, totaled $13.2 million of the, the 20. Uh, this was by the time she gifted it, so this was out of the $22 million. So more than half was in the top six holdings, even though she had 100 stocks in the portfolio. So that's that's not real good diversity there, right? So when I said earlier, when I was talking about diversity, I do think you want to be diverse. She tried to get diverse, but she had several big winning stocks that just kind of took over, right? And generated outsized returns, drove the portfolio, but did make her... Um, a little less diverse, obviously. If you have six holdings told, totaling over half the portfolio, that could be a little bit more suspect if something were to happen that was not positive with one of those big holdings. So that was her big winner, um, the sharing plow, but that also tells you you only need to find one big winner to drive your portfolio. So sharing plow uh, was it. It was actually bought out by Merck in 2009, actually, for $41 billion. So her portfolio would have held it all the way till 2009, as long as uh, Yeshiva or whoever's managing the money at Yeshiva 
kept that position. We don't know what they did, but let's say they did. She got out of it in a success. It being purchased out. It is now owned by Merck. So Merck, ticker MRK, 230 billion market cap. It is a Zach's number two buy right now. And um, it's pretty cheap. PE is 12.5. It has a peg of 1.2. Earnings expected to be up 21.4% here in 2022. Down 1.7 in 2023, however, so um, good this year, maybe a little bit uh, peak earning-ish for 2023, but dividend yielding 3% still. So the drug stocks are still paying these nice dividends. But since they rallied in the 1990s, the drug stocks really have not been great investments. So over the last five years, while tech and growth have been surging, Merck is up 55.1% over those five years. You might think, oh, that's, that doesn't sound too bad. Um, you know, about a little over 10% a year. What's wrong with that? But the S&P was up 77.2% during that time. So you could have just bought the big index and outperformed Merck during that time. But you know what I always say? Things that are down on their luck, industries and sectors for numerous years or decades, usually have a way of turning around at some point, Right. Um, over long haul, things change. So I actually do kind of like some of the drug stocks here as we're in this new decade here. And a lot of them are cheap. So that's Merck, MRK. Then she also owned PepsiCo. That was one of her biggest positions by the time she died. I think it was like her third largest position. It was worth $1.6 million at the time she died. So still quite big position out of a $22 million portfolio. And today it's still around and it owns this, that great snack business now. So it's not all just beverages. Market cap of 244 billion. It too is a Zach's rank number two buy. And um, it's a little more expensive though. Everybody's buying those snacks during the pandemic. It surged. And everybody wanted to own something that we're going to keep buying, even with inflation. Pepsi saying we're still buying the Doritos. We're not trading to the generic. So PE is at 26.7 times. PEG is at 3.5. And dividend yielding 2.6% now. Over the last five years, these shares, though, are only up 52.5%. And again, the S&P 500 up 77%. So really underperformed during that time period because these kind of staple big brand name food companies with slower growth now, they do have slower growth than when she was buying them. Um, they just have been out of favor and now kind of pricey for PepsiCo now. But that's PepsiCo, P-E-P -E is the ticker on that one. Then she owned uh, some aerospace and she owned this company called Allied Signal. I think it was worth about a million dollars, I think they said, on that one. Um, she also owned Bristol Myers Squibb, a million bucks on that one. And then Coke, about 900,000 by the time she died on her Coke position. Um, so several of the big drugs, she just went all in on several of the big drugs. But the aerospace one is kind of interesting because. Honeywell ended up buying Allied Signal in 1999 for 15.1 billion. Honeywell ticker H O N, the big, uh, you know, industrial conglomerate, and they are a Zach's number three hold right here. Market cap of 135 billion, a five-year return on them 55.3 percent. I'm seeing kind of like a pattern here with all these kind of older big branded industrial drug names, uh, you know, staples, food names, all underperforming over the last five years. Uh, so up 55.3, again, S&P 500 up 77 during that time period. What does the P look like? Honeywell, 23 times, peg of 2.4. So not super cheap on the peg, um, but a little pricey again. We're talking on some of these kind of old uh, old industrial names. So what if you had bought one of the uh, kind of tech tech brands from back in the 90s? And what if she had bought one of those? So Microsoft would have been one of the uh, you know obvious choices. It didn't pay a dividend, but it did later 
on, you know, starting in the mid 2000s and it's paid a dividend all these years since then. So over the last five years, Microsoft, because tech and growth have been hot up 302 percent versus that 77 percent on the S&P 500. It is a Zach's number three rank right now with a market cap of 2.2 trillion. We can understand it better these days, right? Microsoft is the Outlook, it's the cloud, Xbox, PCs, LinkedIn. We can understand Microsoft, but the PE is rather elevated. I own it in my own personal portfolio, but PE is now 28.7 times. And the dividend used to be like one and a half, almost 2%. Now, because the shares have soared, Dividend yield down 0.9% now is what you're getting on the dividend. Now, we don't know if she owned any banks because they didn't appear in the top holdings that all these articles talked about. But a lot of people would have to get the dividends and growing earnings back in the day. And they may be back in favor again, like I've talked about. Everything that is down sometimes or many times ends up up in the end if you wait long enough. So one of my favorite on the regional bank sides is PNC Financial, ticker PNC. It too is a Zax3 hold here, 71 billion market cap. PE is just 12.1, peg of 2.6, price to book, which is useful when you look at banks because remember the analysts believe you should buy at one and sell at two for a price to book ratio. They're right in the middle at 1.5. So maybe still has some value there. Um, Dividend yielding 3.4%. But over the last five years, the banks have been very difficult to be Ann Schreiber in the banks. Five years up just 37.4%, really underperforming the S&P 500 up 77% during that time. So we're not even talking about the NASDAQ here, which was up even more in the last five years. This is just the S&P, the big boring S&P. It's not even close. It's way underperforming. But as I said, you know, some things when they're down finally come back into favor But this is a good question to ask. Would you stay in the banks if they were underperforming all these years? And Shiver would have because she didn't like to pay those fees. So she never would have sold them. But her portfolio really would have suffered there. She would have been compounding the dividend as long as they were paying it. Remember, many of them could not pay it during the financial crisis and for years after. They were forbidden from the Federal Reserve from paying it. So a lot going on. Um, with that sector, but sometimes it's darkest before the dawn, as I keep saying. So my final thoughts on Ann Scheiber is, uh, you know, one of the keys to her being able to hold on for 50 years is simply because there wasn't the technology back in the day to even check her portfolio on a computer. She was checking the, uh, trading, you know, what was going on, the stock tickers in the newspaper, um, in the library of the (laughs) universities. She would walk and look at the Wall Street Journal every day to see what the stocks were doing. So you didn't even have, uh, you know, much easy ways to get access to financial data, certainly not with her own account. She would have had to wait to get like quarterly statements or something from her stockbroker. Or, you know, she could have called him and said, hey, what's my account looking like? And I'm sure, you know, obviously he would be telling her. But Today, we have it on our phone, or at least the ability to have it on our phone. And I know there's some of you checking every five minutes, every hour, maybe every day, maybe once a week or once a month. And that kind of access is very difficult in bear markets um, because you get depressed. Let's call it what it is. You see your account going down, 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 and you're like, I've lost all this money. No, I have to get out. I have to save it. I have to do something. And so you might do something that you otherwise might not if you were not looking at it. So buy and hold can work. What she did can actually be done, but you need the time. She had 50 years for that compounding to work. And with compounding, you won't really notice it in just a few years. 
um, unless you have a really hot market like we just had, then yes, it's possible you notice the Tesla compounding, right? But usually it takes much longer, you know, up to 10 years or more before you start to really see, hey, those stocks I bought a while ago are are now doing something. Like those dividends that only used to pay me 50 bucks every quarter are now paying me, you know, $200 every quarter. Hey, those shares I bought with that $50 seven or eight years ago are now, you know, have doubled or tripled in in price in my portfolio. So there will be periods during a long-term buy and hold where the stock goes nowhere or it goes down considerably like we have here in 2022. So what you have to do as a long-term investor is stop looking at your phone every day. That's my advice. I know some of you will keep doing it, but that's my advice. And then look for deals on the stock's that you know and like, like Anne did. Um, keep dollar cost averaging into them. Have a diverse portfolio like she did, but not 100 stocks. <laughs> you can have diversity. I've talked about this on past podcasts with 20 to 30 stocks. And remember, you only need one winner. She had one huge winner. She had five other pretty big sizable winners. But that one big winner really drove her portfolio over the long ta- haul, especially as it paid that dividend out every year, compounding it. And even look at some professional investors from today. I've talked about this in the past too. Buffett really only has Apple as his biggest winner in that portfolio, at least for now. He's trying to make a few other big bets on oil. He has Bank of America as a big position. So if the bank's have a big bull market. He's perfectly positioned for that to become one of his huge mega winners. But for right now, it's really being driven by Apple. And he only bought Apple in 2016. That was just six years ago. So think about that for one moment. Just six years ago is when he added that position. So um, you can do it with just one big winner. And that one isn't even like the longest buy and hold. So do your research, know what you own, buy what you like, reinvest those dividends, rarely sell, but don't sell on a panic if you do sell. Um, stick it out among the bear markets. Don't get fancy. She didn't get fancy. She bought drugs, beverages, entertainment, pretty much, and some telecom and Apple at the end. So you don't have to own the latest hot tech company or even grow stock. You don't have to own cannabis. You don't have to own some biotech that may or may not have a great drug that's coming out. You don't have to own any of those things. You have to buy and hold good quality companies growing their earnings. So that's what Ann did. She left this legacy behind that is still paying out people getting their education today, still making those dividends, these great companies still paying. Now Yeshiva University is the shareholder, um, but still doing it all these years later. So it reminds me of what Warren Buffett said during the great financial crisis is, you know, don't bet against America, its companies, or just innovation in general, because there's always new things happening out there. There's new brands launching and you too can invest in them fairly easily now just on your phone. So now is the time. It's never too late to start. She was 51. She did live to be 101. It does matter for compounding to live the long life, but it's never too late. Um, Remember before she was even 90, that account was worth $10 million. So um, get out there. That's my advice. I'm always inspired when I talk about um, Ann Scheiber because it is an inspiring story. She is just a regular investor like you and I, and um, she liked investing and was smart about it and bought some great companies. So let me recap the stocks I talked about on this episode. So there was Sharing Plow, which is now owned by Merck. So Merck, ticker MRK. PepsiCo, still in business, PEP, 
Microsoft, they're still around. It wasn't in her portfolio, but it could be a kind of Ann Scheiber type of stock. That's why I bought it. And uh, I still own it in my own personal portfolio, ticker MSFT, of course. There's Honeywell, which bought her Allied Signal. They're still around. Um, and their ticker is HON. And then if you're looking for some financials, there's plenty to choose from. I like many of the big banks, but one of the big regionals that is looking pretty good and not too expensive here is PNC Financial, ticker P, N as in Nancy, C. I mentioned a couple other stocks on the show. There's also Eli Lilly that she owned. Um, I mentioned Coke. She owned those. You know where to find those if you're interested. But uh, keep in mind, there's plenty of great companies out there. And um, we're covering a lot of them here on the Zach's Market Edge. So you want to be sure to subscribe so you don't get a single episode. Uh, so you're getting everything. And we can get us on Apple Podcasts. You can get us on Spotify. We're on SoundCloud with the Value Investor Podcast. Yes, I do two podcasts a week. And um, get us somewhere because you don't want to miss any of it. And I'll be back next week with some more stocks. This material is being provided for informational purposes only, and nothing herein constitutes investment, legal, accounting, or tax advice, or a recommendation to buy, sell, or hold a security. Do not act or rely upon the information and advice given in this podcast without seeking the services of competent and professional legal, tax, or accounting counsel. Publication and distribution of this podcast is not intended to create, and the information contained herein does not constitute an attorney-client relationship. No recommendation or advice is being given as to whether any investment or strategy is suitable for a particular investor. It should not be assumed that any investments in securities, companies, sectors, or markets identified and described were or will be profitable. All information is current as of the date herein and is subject to change without notice. Any views or opinions expressed may not reflect those of Zach's investment research as a whole.